Jemima, did you want to start? Thank you. Yes, I think so. Hello, Hello Julian. Everybody, welcome to our second talk for this year. Um, thank you so much, Julia, for doing this for us. I think everybody's so excited to um, hear you and to, uh, to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to hand over to you. Um, have you managed to check if you can hear me? Oh, you did. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Just did. Is it working? Can everybody see yes. some slides there? Perfect. And then yes. I'll for the chat. But everybody, if, if anyone has any questions, you can just um, raise your hand on the bar and then we will... And make sure Julia gets your attention. Yeah, okay. and you can also um, put things in the chat. Um, I can't kind of, the brain doesn't like to do many things at once. It just makes us stress out. So I won't be able to totally monitor the chat um, while I'm speaking, but I love it. If you just want to chime in and speak, that's fine with me, or you can put something in the chat, but feel free. This is not meant to be, you know, just some crazy person talking to you like a recorded head, okay? So yes, I'll feel also free check, to... I'll monitor the chat for you, um, Julia. Thank you. I'm grateful for that. Okay, so let's start. We're going to talk about neurodevelopmental roots of Montessori education. First, I'll tell you who I am. I am a Montessorian, primary trained, uh, and also teaching grown-ups now. Um, and I actually do a lot of this work through my company, Maytree Learning, um, and through the Brain Health Initiative, where I'm a faculty member. And I do guest lectures and teaching assistantships at Harvard, where I did my graduate work. And I love science. And the cool thing, the reason I'm telling you this is because I did my graduate research at Harvard on the movable alphabet, and it won the Dean's Prize. So this is not to say I'm so great. It's to say that the Montessori movable alphabet won the Dean's Prize at, at Harvard for research, right? So this is really exciting. It's starting, Montessori is starting to get people's attention in higher education. So that's great news. Um, and I'm a mom. I have one child by birth, one child by adoption, and a dog by adoption and a husband who's a biochemist and we're totally geeks at the dining room table. We terrify our children and we like it. Okay, who are you? Can you, I'm gonna make my screen a little wider. Can you just raise your hand so I can find out if you have children at home? Just physically raise your hand or you can do the little icon. Okay, a lot of us have children at home. And infant toddler teachers, anyone here an infant toddler teacher? We have Joanne. She the only one? Oh, Joanne. All right. You're courageous. And Shemima sometimes. Okay. Uh, anybody preschool, primary like me, three to six, ages three to six. Okay. Asma, Sumai, Rima, Paige, Shemima, you're my people. Okay. Glad you're here. And Jane, I think. Anybody elementary? We have Rochelle, Guinevere. Okay. So you've got a friend. Ah, and Marika. Thank you, Marika. Okay. And let's see what else. What's next? Anybody adolescent? Any adolescents? Quite a good, she's doing double duty. Okay. All right, great. And then anybody an administrator, head of school or guiding school? So we're mostly all teachers here. Okay, but Samaya is doing that. Okay, and Shemima. Shemima's doing apparently everything. Okay, so if anyone has questions about anything, you just ask her because she knows it all. She's doing it all. Anybody here a scientist? That's me. Anyone? Anyone? Samaya's like maybe? Okay, so first of all, if you're Montessori trained, you are a scientist, so you can all actually raise your hand because you're trained in observation. She didn't have uh, MRIs, she didn't have any fancy imaging, and she still used her eyes and her scientific training to study children in the brain, and it worked, okay, so you can too. Okay, so why did I make time for that? We don't have a ton of time, but it's important to do things like that because emotions and relationships and inspiration are actually essential for learning. And so having this few moments just to get to know each other a little bit, already people started to turn on their screens, things were different, and you started to feel a little bit more comfortable. That's why we have to have relationships with the children that we teach. Because when we're inspired, when we feel comfortable with relationships, we actually have more brain real estate that we can use, okay? So it's important. I know we're supposed to be less uh, delightful than the materials. We want the children to be attached more to the materials than us, but they have to get there through us. So relationships are always the first part of linking children with the work that they need. Does that make sense to everybody? And that's why, and that's, and I showed you the picture of the brain and research says that now you'll think I'm smarter. Okay. So anytime you have a talk to give, put a piece picture of the brain up there and people will think you're smarter. Is it working? Are you thinking maybe she's smarter? No, you're not convinced. Don't be convinced. Okay, I have a quick story to tell you um, about a boy in my class, Timothy. Is everyone teaching in only one language? Or are you teaching 
Anybody teaching in more than one language? Rochelle is, what other language are you teaching in Rochelle? Oh, I, I teach in Afrikaans, which is my mother tongue, <clears throat> okay. and English, yeah. Afrikaans and English, and you're teaching in both, okay. And Rahima? I teach English and Kiswahili. And Swahili, Kiswahili, okay, great. Awesome, oh, this is perfect for you. Uh, so Muriel Dwyer is one of my, uh, I fangirl her, but she's passed away now, but she was an AMI teacher trainer in London and in Africa, and I'm not sure exactly where, but she taught in English and Swahili. And she developed, she refined the Montessori method so it worked for partially phonetic languages like Swahili and like English. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this quick story about Timothy learning English. Uh, I had a boy in my class who arrived um, and just from China, he'd been in the States only a week before and he didn't speak any English. And he came in and he was just crying and upset like crazy the first couple of weeks. We tried every day, we started showing him things, showing him things. I taught, my daughter was in the class with us. I taught her a few phrases that I knew in Chinese. And one day he wasn't crying. He was just sitting there doing, I don't know, I think he had the cards and counters of all things. He wasn't, anyway, he had the cards and counters that he's doing and he wasn't crying. So we were happy and he's doing the work. And, he, and my daughter's sitting at the table and she goes, ni hao, ni hao ma. And he goes, ni hao ma. She goes, wahang ha. He goes, wahang ha. She goes, she she. He goes, she she. And she goes, don't copy me. And he goes, don't copy me. Right. So that was the first thing he ever said in English. He said it because she had this relationship with him. So that's a little example of how important relationships are. Once he did that, everyone's like, Timothy, did you just speak English? And we all like had a little parade around the classroom. We were so excited. And everything changed for him at that moment because he realized he had social support connection and some capacity that he was going to succeed. So that's super important with all of our students for every age to make sure that we're acknowledging that. Um, in what we do. Okay, the brain is always learning. So right now your brain is different than it was 10 minutes ago. It's gonna be different in an hour and it'll be different tomorrow, okay? It's always learning, that's what it defaults to, it has to do it. And we kind of know that the brain changes as it learns because look at the baby's brain is so small and our grown-up brains are a lot bigger, right? So there's a lot of change, physical change happening. We're not born with the brain that we'll have for the rest of our life. We create our brain uh, in large part based on the experiences we have in the environment, but also based on biology. They both really matter, okay? We're born with most of the neurons. The neurons are these little cells. Half of the cells in the brains are neurons. We're born with most of them at birth, but they're not refined, okay? And let me tell you more about that. Our genes are turning on and off all the time based on experience and environment. And here's a picture of two identical twins. You can see poor little Otto has not been exercising in Ewald, right? He's all buff. Same genetics, same DNA, different expression. That's based on what we do. The brain is very similar. How we use it changes its fitness, okay, and its health. Here's how it works in the little baby brain. When you're born, over here, you can see you have these little black dots. Those are the neuron cell bodies, okay, or the soma. And these long, skinny lines are the connections between the neurons. So the long ones, if I can get my arrow to work there. Um, the long ones show you the axon and the skinny ones at the end show you the dendrite. Now you can see when you're one month old, it's still really sparse. When you're six month old, it's starting to get crowded. And at two years, there's a lot going on. It's really crowded. But do you see that it's not the number of black dots that's changing? Instead, it's the skinny lines. Can everybody see that? So that skinny lines, that's connections, okay? It's, and that's driven by the genetics, genetics and environment. And these overcrowded connections, the brain on purpose proliferates tons and tons and tons of connections, but it's not efficient, right? And you can think about it this way. It's like you're the little kid who has to go from point A to point B, but how do you get there? You go like everywhere, all over the place. There's not one clear direct path. And this is why it takes little kids forever to do anything, right? It's not because they're slow or they didn't hear us. So we say, okay, put on your shoe. Okay, put on your shoe. And we're waiting and we're waiting. It takes them longer to process that information because they don't have clear pathways, okay? This is one of the reasons why we slow down so much when we're working with young children. That Dr. Montessori taught us that. We have to go slow down at their level because their brain just can't process things as quickly as ours. So we slow down, okay? And there's the brain science behind why we slow down. Now, as we age, 
these underused connections get pruned away. All right. And so we've got the, oh, somebody's unmuted. It's a little distracting. Did you want to say something, Baba Wa? I think it's Baba Wa. Someone is. Oh, someone's having a nice conversation. <laughs> Can you figure out who it is, Shemima, and meet them? That'd be great. So at birth, we have these sparse connections like you saw. And then at age seven, it's very crowded. Okay. And then at age 15, it's not so crowded. So is that like what happens with Guinevere? She's teaching the adolescents. That's what happens, right? They lose all their connections. So they're crazy when they're teenagers. No, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. This is the way that the brain actually makes these neural networks efficient. And it turns, basically, we start with like the desert, then we end up like a woodland path. And then we turn it into a stage. Okay. As we go through those stages of, of pruning. Does that make sense to everybody? And that's much more efficient to be on that super highway instead of this tangled jungle path. Okay. All right. You're already doing great with neuroscience. So this is physically creating the structure of our brain. And this is just a picture of some myelinated tracks, physically creating it anytime we do something repeatedly. We help create those neural networks. Okay, so this is why Dr. Montessori said every unnecessary aid is an obstacle to development, right? Because it's the child who has to be engaging in the world if they want strong neural networks, right? If we're doing it for them, we're, we already have those strong neural networks. We don't need it. They need to do it to develop their neural networks. And in neuroscience, we say practice makes permanent, okay? Practice makes permanent. Not perfect, but permanent. So we need to engage in the world to build a strong brain and passive weak networks. If you got passive life over here, now this, these are not my husband's feet. I'm just, they're not my husband's feet. And then this is okay. okay. Engaging actively, very good for the brain. Okay. Making sense so far. Any questions so far? Are we doing okay? Okay. Yes. Smart people. Ah, here's a quiz. Let's see if it's true. We're born with most of the neurons we'll have. True or false? You can say it, type it, think it. True or false? What do you guys think? We're born with most of the neurons we'll have. It's true. We are born with most of the neurons we'll ever have, about 86 billion plus or minus 8 billion. So I might have 8 billion fewer neurons than you, and it's okay. Okay? Human variability is normal. It's normal, and it's a good thing. Okay. Another question. Anything we do repeatedly, the brain learns to do more efficiently. True or false? Rochelle's giving me the thumbs up. I see a true. I, sh I hear a true. The answer is true. Anything we do repeatedly. So if we get a little stressed out and we're like, okay, I'll do a little yoga, I'll meditate, or I'll eat the cookie, our brain's going to get very good at whatever it is we do repeatedly. So if like we're always going for the cookie, we'll be like, Oh, I'm just going to eat a cookie, eat a cookie. Every time you feel stressed out, you're going to want the cookie. So be careful what you choose to do because the brain's going to get good at it if you do it repeatedly. And with little kids, it doesn't take many repetitions at all for them to become really solid in their networks, right? Because their brain is programmed a little differently than ours. Okay. So uh, next thing, any questions so far? Are we good? You like my jokes? Okay. With the cookie joke. Okay. Next, forgetting is a normal part of learning. I know this is like, you're not going to believe this. Okay. So here I'm talking about dynamic skill theory, dynamic development of skills. Here's what happens right now. We're all together. We're talking about brain. We're talking about repetition. We're talking about pruning. And you're like, this is cool. I'm there, right? Okay. Tomorrow, right? Your friend, your partner asks you, what did you talk about? Okay. So here you are right now. We're like, here, we're getting it. Somebody asks you tomorrow and you're like, I, I don't know, something about the brain, right? But then maybe you read an article, you see, you come watch the video for this or another one of my videos. And you're like, oh, you're up here at the next level. And you're kind of bumping your, your knowledge up there a little bit. Then it's going to fall apart. Then it's going to rebuild it, fall apart, and you reconstruct it. So the brain goes through this series of constructing, deconstructing, reconstructing, deconstructing our knowledge on the way to mastery, right? And so, but when we test, sometimes when we do standardized tests in school, we only see performance down at this low level because it doesn't have any scaffold, any support. 
So every time you're with people talking about it, seeing in the same space, the whole Montessori environment is like a scaffold because it reminds you of things. A scaffold is something that helps you a little bit and reminds you of things. That's a support. And so, of course, you get a little clue. It's like a little second period reminder so you can do a little better. And that's why testing may look differently, the standardized test versus what we're physically witnessing in the classroom. Does this make sense to people? Are you see, do you see that difference sometimes? Okay. All right. And then processing time is super important for memory consolidation. So processing time is time when we're not on our phone, you know, like not on the phone, right? We're like not on a screen. We're not, we're just thinking, maybe staring outside. Maybe we're outside sitting down. Nothing intentional is happening. We're just processing. And I'll tell you this little study they did on this little mouse. They had a little cap on his head. And they watched him go through the maze, okay? And the, the mouse got to point A in the maze and a little part in the brain light up, like point A. And then goes to point B, little point B lights up, point C, point C lights up, point D, he stops, he scratches, he sniffs, and point D, C, B, and A light up. It's in the pause that everything comes together. So pausing is super, super important. and. With the children, this is why we let them work at their own pace, right? This is why we don't mind if they stare out the window. Maybe they need to stare out the window, right? It's not a problem. And for ourselves, at the end of this talk, I'll get the very end, I have a little uh, thing for you to do. But if you just take five minutes, three minutes to pause and can think about what you just learned, try to pull it together, your memory for it will be dramatically improved the next day. Sleep is also super important for memory consolidation. So try very much to pay attention to your sleep. Don't stay up all night with your friends, at least not every night. And make sure you try to get enough sleep. It's super important. Okay. As you master a skill, the brain becomes more efficient at using the skill. And this is why Dr. Montessori calls for repetition and wants all the materials to invite, encourage, and, and for guides to inspire repetition in the children. Okay. Here's how it works in the brain. Here's a picture of an 11 year old brain during reading. Okay, these are the parts of the brain that light up when you're reading and you're 11, okay? What happens when we're older? We use a lot less brain real estate. Why? Because we're all super highway now, no more jungle, right? We're super highway, we need hardly anything to do it. So what does this mean? That for us, reading is effortless. Right. Once we get to this mastery level, it's no effort. But for the child, it's effortful. We have to remember, I think sometimes it's so easy for us adults because something's so simple for us and effortless for us, we forget how much effort it takes the child to do it. And this is a real clear example of that. Okay. So once we're pros, it becomes easier. There's more resources available in the brain. Any questions about that? You know, I'm going fast. I'm giving you guys so much stuff. Okay. Okay, I'll go on. So learning is easier when you're younger, but we're never too old, never too old. And this is how plasticity works. Plasticity means the capacity of the brain to change. You've probably heard neuroplasticity, that term before, yeah? So it's the capacity of the brain to change. And when we're young, this is the amount of plasticity. And this red line showing us effortless plasticity, which just happens to us because we exist. And you can see when we're little, here's age going across the bottom, getting older, and then up here is how much effort. When we're little, it's effortless plasticity. The brain just changes, 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 changes. And as we get older, we can still change the brain, but we have to try harder. It takes more effort, okay? So don't for a second think that you can't do it just because you're, you know, like me, over the 50 mark, you know, halfway there, you can still do it. You just might have to work harder. And that can be discouraging because you're like, oh, why is this so hard? You feel dumber, but it just will take you more effort. So be patient with yourself and don't stop learning. It's really good for the brain to keep learning. Okay. And the sensitive periods are periods of more plasticity where the brain is primed to learn specific types of things. And there is some evidence in neuroscience research, neurobiology for sensitive periods, but it's just a little bit of research. We need a lot more research on it but it's true that they exist. We can definitely say that. So what you've studied from Dr. Montessori, she was pretty much spot on with sensitive periods. 
Now, executive functions may also have a sensitive period. Has everybody, has everybody heard? Can you raise your hand if you're familiar with executive functions? I want to make sure it's not a cultural thing. That oh, I got my hand raised. That's cool. Yeah, I'm familiar with executive functions. I don't know who raised my hand. <laughs> That's fun. Wait, I should put my hand down. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh well, put my hand down. Lower hand. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Oh, and Kat is clapping too, or she's just randomly hitting buttons like me. Okay. <laughs> so executive functions. These are the foundations. Um, what we do when we're little is we're working on um, foundational executive function skills, like working memory, which is the ability to keep track of something um, that you're going to use later. Like if you don't put your shopping list on your phone, right, and you just remember, you know, the things you have to get at the grocery store or at the market then that's your working memory being used, okay? Um, inhibitory control is not doing something unskillful. So like if your boss yells at you, you don't yell back. Or if a parent, if a parent comes in all feisty with you, you don't fight back, you're calm, even though they're coming at you. So you have inhibitory control or not eating the third cookie. I like cookies. That's inhibitory control, okay? Just have two, okay. I'm not, that's my weakness. So it also, in children, they're developing inhibitory control, and that is really directly related with self-regulation, okay? This response inhibition, is, is, and it's part of executive functions. Another foundational part of executive functions is cognitive flexibility, and that's the ability to think of what somebody else might be thinking. And we know when little children, they don't quite have the ability to abstract knowledge yet when they're in plain one. Dr. Montessori was right about that. Somewhere around age five, six, four, five, six, they start to develop that ability. It gets a little more advanced. And that's when they can think of someone else's perspective. So like if you have, you, you and your, okay, my example, my husband loads the dishwasher and he always puts the bowls on the bottom, but I know that the bowls belong on the top. Now, if I have cognitive flexibility, I will not make him or I will not reload the dishwasher right? To put things where I think they should be. So if I'm inflexible cognitively, I'll be like, you okay, I'll load the dishwasher. Okay, do you get it? So that's cognitive flexibility. Thinking, okay, this is the, not the right way, really, but it's going to be okay if they do it that way. Okay? Cognitive flexibility. Even if it's not your idea, it might still work. Thinking that somebody else has possibly. It's not funny. All right. So these are all part of higher level executive functions. All right, that come together to form this ability that we get as we're older to reason, to problem solve, and to plan. And these are really important for everything, right? Shemima, did you want to say something? Um, yes, I just wanted to ask a question. Is it possible to have um, cognitive flexibility in certain situations, but not in others? So, like, at Give like, me an example. So, right? is so typical of what I could do at home, <laughs> you know, like really flip if someone does that but at work if someone does something a little bit differently to me I, I can manage it I can cope I can so yeah 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 no I that is totally normal Shamama. it can be context dependent and so you can have because we all context really matters to us right like how we behave as humans if you go home with your sister or something you're like you put on your sweats, you put your feet up, right? You're relaxing, you're having your favorite snacks, whatever. But then when you're in the office, you behave differently. When you're in the school, you behave differently, right? That's context that we can all relate to. And the way our brain expects to behave is tied with that because it's getting clues from what it's experiencing in the environment. That's a great question, Shania. That's a really good question. Okay, so these executive functions are developing dramatically before age six. And here, I'll show you how this works. This is your proficiency going up on the left with executive functions, your capacity. And then along the bottom is getting older, okay? And you can see we have this kind of big jump from ages three to six. Look at this, boom, right? That's when it's all really, really developing, okay? And then there's another bump in adolescence that happens. You get this other thing. Now, the bumps doesn't mean it's perfected. It means it's being worked on. So it doesn't mean that three to six-year-old has so much cognitive flexibility. Oh my gosh, no, right? It means that they're learning. They're developing that capacity, 
Okay. They don't have it yet, but they're developing it. It's like they started their weight training and it's going to take them, you know, six, three years to get strong. Right. So, and just so you know, I'm there, which is lower than my 17 year old son. So I'm a little, little concerned about that, but that's true. Okay. So they're working, working very hard on, it, okay. When they're adolescents and when they're three to six. Now, what do we do in the environment that supports this? What does Dr. Montessori set up the environment with these freedoms, right? Freedom and, and discipline, liberty and discipline. And the child has to be free to choose their own activity and where to do it, right? And this is exercising those executive functions, planning, reasoning. Well, this is a rug work or this is a table work, right? Um, oh, I don't want to work next to him. I'm going to work over there, right? Uh, they need to work at their own pace. And that has to do, again, with that memory consolidation and that repetition, the level that they need and repeat as much as they need, right? So the children need all of these freedoms um, in order to really exercise their executive functions. And Dr. Montessori just got that. That's what our whole, all of those talks you hear about freedom and discipline, freedom and liberty. That's what this is about. It's about developing executive functions. Now they're not free to do anything dangerous, destructive, or demeaning, okay? So if they're doing anything that's dangerous, destructive, or demeaning, we as the adult have an obligation to intervene right away because we can't subject the rest of the environment to that and we have to protect their safety as well as the safety of the other um, humans in the space, right? But if it's not dangerous, destructive, or demeaning, then we have to pause and observe and then figure out what we do later at a neutral moment, okay? You don't have to dive in. You might still need to go intervene, but you can pause, consider, and then make a, an intelligent, informed choice, reflective choice. Does that make sense to everybody so far? I see heads. Thank you so much for having your camera on. It's so much nicer to see your little heads bobbing. Social cognition. Okay, this is great. Now, another aspect of the three Ds, I call them the three Ds. For, thank you, Vado, thank you. But, um, that these three Ds create stress responses, okay? When people are behaving dangerously or they're doing something destructive or de they're demeaning others, it creates stress in the environment. Stress is very, very bad for learning acute stress. And so good, there is good stress, it's called you stress. And that's like, you're doing something and it's, it's hard, but you can get there, you know, it's a stretch but you'll be able to get it if you just keep applying yourself. And that's a good kind of a stress. It's like the stress of working out to get bigger muscle, right? It's a good stress. But this is a different kind of stress. I'm talking about acute stress. And so normally, right now, nobody seems stressed out. Y'all seem good. I see smiley, happy faces. Okay, so we're not stressed out. So this is how your brain is working. You have a lot of activity up here in the front of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. That's what PFC stands for. And then all of this is kind of regulating what happens in the rest of the brain and the rest of the body. It's in charge, normal, moderate levels of neurotransmitter release, release. Things are just humming along. It's kind of like that joyful hum of work when the environment's going well in your class, right? Okay, acute stress happened. Your boss walks in, your mother walks in, somebody yells at you, right? All of a sudden you're like, ah, what just happened? The energy in your brain physically moves down into this limbic area to the emotional response areas. Okay, it leaves your prefrontal cortex physically and gets increased here and you get high levels of neurotransmitter release. Okay, so what is that like? So let's see, and then somebody asks you, you know, they yell at you and then they're like, and how are you gonna fix it? You're like, uh, I don't know. And I'm, something comes out of your mouth, who knows if it's intelligent or not, right? But you, the reason why is because you can't access your full brain capacity in those moments when you're having a stress response. This is very difficult to access. Now, what triggers me and what triggers you is different. Every person is triggered by different things. Sometimes it's tiny things. Sometimes it has to do with the rest of what's going on in your day, you know, no. and something tiny will like, oh, you're stressed, right? Sometimes you can handle a lot and it doesn't stress you out. People are different from day to day and from person to person. We're different in what causes an acute stress response, but it's one of our big higher guiding goals in the environment is not to correct because we don't want to create this acute stress response. So we say, don't correct, represent. So when you see the child, if you're giving a presentation and, and you're, you're showing them how to do something and they're totally botching it, 
you don't say it's wrong. You just say, can I have a turn? And you take another turn so that you can represent it. If it's still not working, you say, let's try it again another day. And you put it away, right? But if you're watching them doing something on their own and they're messing up, you really, you want to observe, unless it's the three Ds, and then decide, should you interrupt or should you give them a new presentation at another moment? And nobody can tell you what the exact right thing to do is in that moment. You have to observe and know your children, right? But you don't want to create stress responses. So always keep that in mind when you go to intervene with a child. If you can gently just like move your hand or can I have a turn and just do something, then that usually is very helpful. But if it's something bigger than that, be careful. And you know your child because some children know acute stress response from just standing near them, right? And some children, you could, you know, do a ballet in front of them and they won't even notice you exist. So it depends on the child you're working with. Any questions about the stress? This is a big thing because I know all of us experience these acute stress responses in our own life. Sometimes in our families, it happens a lot, sometimes not a lot if we're fortunate. But this is troublesome for the brain as far as learning concerns. So is, is concerned. So remember, if there is an acute stress response that happens and they do happen, know that that's probably not the best teachable moment, not a good time to teach. But later, at a neutral moment, come back to what happened, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? I see it, thank you for shaking your head. Vado has a question, go ahead, Vado. Okay, so what happens if you're in an environment and you accidentally, you know, um, you accidentally show the child you are frustrated of the child not understanding and getting it, and you um, you provoke these stress responses. Now the child is crying. Now the child is just not listening. And then you want to like kind of calm the child back down once you have sent it yourself. How do yeah. you um, how do you calm the child and let and let the child like trust? Uh, come out to the child that actually it was teacher who actually had like, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry that I freaked out on you. How do you call? Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, I think you pretty much answered your question, Vado. I, the thing yeah. is, you have to always respond with compassion. Compassion is the first response, and that includes compassion to ourselves. So like, there's nothing where in my mind, like there's nothing I beat myself up more about than the times that I've lost it, you know, with children. It's like, oh my gosh, you like, I still, I can tell you, you know, blow by blow what happened, you know, 20 years ago, you know, when I really messed up, you know, and we beat ourselves up over that. So compassion includes compassion with ourselves yeah. as well as compassion with the children. Okay. So when you do have a mistake, when you do, you know, have unskillful behavior, I think you're exactly right about it. You want to acknowledge it. You want to say, I am terribly sorry. That was a really unskillful response. Um, and I apologize. I'm going to work on not behaving that way again. And, you, you know, you can say about, you, you can even work it into grace and courtesy, maybe the next day, you know, like, what could I do instead and do grace and courtesy lessons about it? But that day, probably not because you're a little raw. So you right. might not be so skillful, but maybe right. the next day so that they then they also know that you mean it. Yes. And then you can create a culture of a skillful response to whatever it was that triggered you. Does that help? Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Anything else or should we go ahead? Go ahead. Okay. Well, this is fun. Okay. Relationships buffer stress. So this is again, why these uh, connections with the children are so important. Um, they help and it. This is a crazy graph. Don't worry about it. But oxytocin is good. And oxytocin we get when we have strong relationships. Okay, so it's really important. And one of the challenges that we've had, um, especially in America with the pandemic, and I think they've had this in China too, where they've had crazy lockdowns. Um, it, there's so much loneliness now. And so stress affects us much more deeply because we've been isolated from each other, right? And we need those social connections to really keep our brain healthy. Our brain, think about it. We are designed to be communal um, beings, 
right? We're designed to live in communities. That's what humans do. And so our brains are programmed to meet, want those human relationships and to seek them out because we have better survival rates when we live in community. So that's why that's just, you can think about it from an evolutionary perspective as to why we need those relationships. It's for our thriving and survival. Okay, so oh, here's a quiz. Are you ready? Correcting a child when they make a mistake is important for learning. True or false? Everybody, yes, Joanne's like, no, 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 no. That's right, Joanne, false. Corrections can lead to an acute stress response which interferes with learning. It's more skillful to wait for a neutral moment and represent the lesson. Yes, okay. Next, it requires more brain energy for a child to tie their shoes than for an adult. True or false? True, heads are shaking true. Yes, it's true. More energy because they have these tangled connections they're trying to get through where we have super highways. Okay, oh, here's another one. To better remember this information, tomorrow you might want to rewatch the video or connect with someone else who is here now. True or false? True. That's right, true. Skills develop dynamically over time with practice. Knowledge predictably falls apart and is then reconstructed to make it better. So if you don't know each other yet, I strongly recommend you chat and exchange some contact information so you can have a little brain geek, Montessori, neuroscience geek friend group, okay? And you can hang out and make friends. Marie Kay, you have a question. I hope I said your name correctly. Sorry, I just couldn't get the button to lower my hand yet. <laughs> oh, oh, but it's great. It let me see you. So that was nice. <laughs> okay. All right. Any questions so far? Are we good? You guys are wicked smart. Oh, there's another quiz. If a child is gazing, gazing out the window instead of focusing on their work, you should go tell them to get back to work. B, ask them if they are upset about something. C, pause and observe. See, at Joanne's going like this. Everybody see? You think see? Yes! See, you're right. Processing downtime is important for memory consolidation and brain health. Okay, very good. You guys are smart. So these risk and protective factors are influencing the brain's ability to learn. We can think about a stress, like toxic stress, if you're in stress all the time, that's a risk factor. It makes it harder for the brain to learn, harder for the brain to develop optimally. Okay, but protective factors positive relationships, supportive schools, right? Lots of different things are either risk or protective factors. I can't go through all of this list now, but I'll just focus on one thing that can be a risk factor or a protective factor for us. And that's what we think, how we think. So many of us have this internal editor. And I think, I don't know if this is more common, I'll be culturally curious to hear how it is in South Africa. In the U.S., many people have this really negative internal editor. So you'll hear yourself saying, oh, how did you mess up? Gosh, that was so bad. I can't believe, you, again, didn't you learn? Haven't you learned, right? So I see head shaking. So is this still common in South Africa? You have a common experience? Actually, in Tibet, this is an uncommon experience. It's a very culture. It's a cultural thing. It's not just biologically the same. So I'm glad to know that. Okay, that's curious to know. Anyway, these internal narratives change the way our brain forms. Now think about it. Anything we do repeatedly, our brain gets more efficient at. So if we're constantly saying, I'm the worst, I'm the worst, I'm the worst, or he's the worst, he's the worst, he's the worst, right? Our brain gets really good at using that neural pathway. Anything we do repeatedly. So when you notice yourself having these kind of negative or unskillful thoughts, it's so important to notice and then try to shift. But noticing is the first step. Even if you keep having them, just noticing them, you're on a way, you're on your way. And this is because we have this negativity bias. Has everybody heard of the negativity bias? There was a big book out about it. Oh, this is cool. Some of us have. So we, because it helps with survival, our brain is kind of programmed to really notice tricky things. Like if something is negative or scary, we're like, our brain's like, pay attention, pay attention, because we want to set ourselves up not to be, you know, killed by the tiger, right? They're chasing us. And so, or the barking dog, whatever. So we get really good at paying attention to negative things. But optimism is more important for thriving. And depending on their environment that you're in, you may not have so many threats, right? That are coming at you all the time. You don't have 
the tiger running across at you, you know, not usually we don't, we have bears, we don't have tigers, we have bears and moose, but maybe once in a lifetime, you would have that interaction. It's not happening every week, right? Because I live rural, I live in the woods. Okay, so we want our brain to be working for what is actually needs to do instead of a perceived threat. So a lot of this, you know, scrolling, 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 oh my gosh, that happened now, that happened now, that happened, you know, the world is ending, death scrolling, that's because we have this desire to find out what's wrong. And that's why the news is telling us that all the time. You know, if it bleeds, it leads, they say here in the States. That's why they have this crazy stories are in the news all the time because we're programmed to pay attention to that. But if we want to thrive, and especially in our environments with our children, we want to thrive and have them thrive, we need to try and shift that and focus on the positive. An assets-based approach is what they call it now, assets-based approach to learning and to development. So we have to reframe our thinking, okay? We can't follow the same pattern. So here's an example. That politician is horrendous, right? And this is true for every culture. Every, I don't care what country you're in. Everybody has this belief sometimes about somebody, okay? So what can we think instead? This is our chance to see if the checks and balances in our government really work, okay? All right, that's the optimistic alternative. He totally has ADHD. Do you call attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Is that a big thing over there? I see some people shaking their head. Okay, so some diagnosis, he has ADHD, totally has it. Unskillful thought. His interests are broad, okay? Because there's gifts. ADHD, I just want to tell you, people with ADHD, they're entrepreneurs. They are ruling the world. Dyslexia, Nobel Prize winners, ADHD, starting businesses. So don't worry, okay? Focus on the assets, not the deficits. I think Vado has some personal experience with that. She's like, yes, ADHD. Yes, can't hold you back. Okay, the child is absolutely out of control. I'm, maybe you've never had that thought. I had a child in my class that I thought that about. This child is just starting to develop his executive functions. He'll get there hopefully soon. Okay, it's really important for us to try and notice when we're thinking having negative patterns about somebody. And here, I'll tell you a bit, little bit more about that. So adaptation and modeling. Um, our behavior dramatically affects those around us. Okay, we have social cognition. And here's this wonderful, these pictures of, you know, Michelle Obama and her daughters. And they're, look at their posture, their facial expressions. It's so similar, right? These children have adapted to the culture of their family. These children have adapted to the culture of their family. Look at the relaxed, hunched, like they're just like, their body posture is completely different based on the culture of their family, right? And the same thing goes for the broader culture. We completely adapt whether we're standing closer or farther away, using our hands to talk. Maybe that's just me because I'm crazy. Or, you know, some countries, you don't do it. Looking straight at people in the eye or looking down when we speak with them, right? It's very, it's cultural. We adapt to our culture so that we become a, a time, a person over time, place, and group. And Dr. Montessori said, the child reproduces in himself as by a form of psychomimesis, the characteristics of the people in his environment, okay? And in neuroscience, we talk about this in terms of mirror neurons. So I'll tell you a quick story about how mirror neurons were discovered. There was a scientist and he was doing research with this monkey and the monkey was not doing what he wanted. And the scientist is like getting frustrated. So the scientist like takes a break and he's like eating peanuts, right? And the monkey wants a peanut. And the scientist is like, no, you're not getting my peanut. I'm just eating them. And so the scientist then, like a big intelligent scientist goes like this and sticks out his tongue at the monkey, right? Like you can't have a peanut. And then the monkey sticks out his tongue at the scientist. And what happened in the monkey's brain is that when he saw the scientist stick out his tongue and when he stuck out his own tongue, the same parts of the brain were active. When we perceive someone else is experiencing something, our brain experiences that same thing to a lesser degree, but it still experiences it. So this is super important for why, you know, Dr. Montessori is like, you have to wear your finest clothes, you have to use your finest language, you have to move with elegant, graceful movements. We have to offer the best possible example of humanity, even if we can only hold it together for the school day, and then we go home and we're like, ah, you know, but at least then, right, we have to offer the best possible example of humanity. 
to the children because they will, they experience it. That's forming their neural network. Okay. And of course, this brings up a lot of things about screens and, and what they're watching, um, et cetera. But I can't go there today. That's a whole, that's a whole, that's a, that's a week, that one. Okay, but any questions about mirror neurons? Does that make sense? You're getting it, you're with me. And this is part of social cognition. Children tend to pay attention to what we pay attention to. So here, look, you look at this picture. What's the first thing you look at with this picture? The first thing, now you're all looking around and you're looking at everything. What was the first thing you looked at? You looked at her eyes, right? Okay, some people are right. All right, come, just come along with me. You look at her eyes. Okay, first we make eye contact and students will pay attention to what we pay attention to. And then we follow her gaze. And now we look at what she's looking at. Okay, so this is why in the classroom, we have to overlook so much. We want the children to see the best things in the classroom, to notice the best things in the classroom and overlook as much as we can. Right. So I had this one student in my classroom and he was the first child I didn't like. It's true. I didn't like him. And I don't understand that because I love children. I'm like, I love all children and I think they're all beautiful. No, this child I didn't like and I thought he was ugly. OK. And I can't even believe that happened to me. I was like astonished because it was totally out of character for me. And he's in my class and he's there like with his pencil. He's like going like this to the kids with scissors. Like he was like cutting people in my classroom. I'm like this is who I get. Oh, my gosh. And so I called my trainer. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this child. you got to help me. And she goes, you have to love him more than you love every other child in that classroom. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> That's a big ask. And so she goes, fake it till you make it. Just do it. Start doing it. And so I started. He couldn't be away from me because he was injuring the other children or threatening to injure the other children. So I'm just like, oh, Kevin, just can you sit with me while I give this lesson? I just like it when you're next to me. You know, and oh, we're lining up. Kevin, would you hold my hand? I just love it when you hold my hand when we line up. And so I'm doing this all day long, keeping this child with me because he wasn't, he couldn't be free, right? He was too destructive. But I wasn't saying you have to be with me. I was like, I just love it when you're with me. Three weeks go by. We're lining up. Lining up. And the, I hear two of the other children in this class say, why do you think Kevin's her favorite? <laughs> I'm like, it worked. It worked. Oh my gosh. Because otherwise, what I had started to do before I had this, you know, twist in my behavior change, a skillful change, is I had been every time he did something wrong, I was like, oh, Kevin, oh, Kevin, no, Kevin, don't do that, don't do that. And I was calling his name. And what started happening? All the children in the classroom were like, Kevin was absent. And they're like, Kevin did it. Kevin did it. You know, he's not even at school that day and they're blaming him. And that was me. That was me. I had to stop doing that. I had to change my behavior because we, the children pay attention to what we pay attention to. So we have to overlook as much as we can. If it's not dangerous, destructive, or demeaning, let it go for the moment, pause and observe and find a skillful way to redirect the behavior or to represent the information. Does that make sense? Is that, I see a lot of, I see a lot of heads nodding about that. Yeah. I bet we all have stories like that, huh? Not that you guys ever had a child you didn't love because you're all perfect, but I, flawed, totally had that child. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, quiz, you knew, it was gonna, you knew it was coming. If you had children policing your class looking for unskillful behavior, it may be because A, they are inherently naughty, B, they want to be police officers when they, when they grow, grow up, up, or C, C other people other in the people room are constantly drawing attention to bad behavior. The answer is C, we got the C, okay, C. All right, overlook as much as you can, okay? And if you notice that the children are doing it, always look to yourself, because they generally, could be us, could be their family, could be another adult, could be something else, but it can also be us, okay? Oh, when my friend opens a bag of chips, I want to eat them because A, I have no self-control, B, my body really needs those chips, or C, my mirror neurons are working. Which one is it? C, we got C, that's right. We, we perceive that something is happening to someone else, our brain becomes activated as if we were experiencing that very thing. So like your mouth is already salivating. And you've got the friend has those chips. You're, you can't even see the chips. They're in the other room. You're the chips. 
Okay, that's mirror neurons. And so that's why our modeling matters so, so much with the children. Okay, so optimal development. Here we go. It involves the gene, our genes, which is our biology and our environment, okay? The genes include sensitive periods. We're driven to learn certain things at certain times. The environment includes things like sleep, relationships, nutrition, health, illness, okay? All of those things affect us. Social cognition is kind of wrapped around that. So the core is genes and environment. Outside of that is social cognition and cultural adaptation, how we're changing to fit into the world that we're in. Our interests and our sensitive periods are driving things beyond that. What do we pursue? What do we persist with? And all of this is required for opportunity and practice is required for all of this. So this is this interplay of different things that we need to have really optimal development. And in, a, you know, in our Montessori environments, that's what we're doing, right? We're hitting some of these key things for the children. Okay. And so now we have a few minutes for questions or discussion, but I want to just let you know that if you want to learn more, you can go to my website, Matri Learning. Uh, we make Montessori materials, but I have all of this stuff on my pedagogy blog, on my YouTube channel um, that can, if you're interested and want to geek out with your friends, you can go have a neuroscience geek party on me yeah, learning, learning or, and I'm also faculty on the brain health initiative. And we have a lot of resources on that website as well. And then I'll show you, Oh, Oh, anybody who wants to support Montessori research, everybody thinks Montessori research is important, right? We all know that it's super important. So we are, um, we started a Montessori research pool. And if you are willing to sign up, it's for all over the world. We just got like 200 people in Poland to sign up last week. I was in Poland. Um, and if you are willing to sign up, anybody who's involved, parents, administrators, grandparents, um, teachers, uh, former students, if you can sign up for this, here's the, uh, the QR code with your phone. You can just snap a picture um, and it'll take you to the website. Vado's doing it. Yes. Um, then you can put your information in so that you can sign up. And this is uh, administered by the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. And any researcher who is, has a research project that they want to do, they have to get approval from their university's ethics board. And then they can ask to asset, access the research pool. So just signing up doesn't mean you'll ever be asked to participate in research. It just means that researchers could ask you if you'd like to be in their study. And then you can say yes or no. So it's not signing up just means you have the option. A researcher could find you. And then you could say yes or no. So I highly, highly, highly encourage you. And I'm staying on the screen for a long time, hoping that everybody scans the QR code, please, um, so that we can get more people. Because I personally have a research study I'm doing, and I need some people in it. And so I'm going to use the research pool to try and find people. So spread the word about that. Okay. And then here are references. I didn't make anything up. Everything actually has references. And then we have a couple minutes to talk. And then I'd like to do. Um, at the end, I would like you to just um, take a minute to consolidate your memory and write down three things you didn't know before we began. D do it right now. Let's take two minutes. Three things you didn't know before we began. Two things you'd like to continue to research as your curiosity has been piqued. And one thing you'll change in your personal or professional life based on what you just learned. So two minutes starting now. Go ahead.
Okay. Okay. So if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, I'll stop sharing my screen. We can just see each other. Feel free to just unmute yourself or type in the chat. Anybody have a Kevin in their class? No Kevins? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to chat because I've got a Kevin in my class. I, I call him a 16 in one. He was absent today and it was just such a calm day. Oh, yeah. And I'm just really struggling with him. But when you spoke about the child, you had, okay, this, my boy is not hurting others but he's interfering with others all the time he probably does have the adhd thing because he's smart in other ways but i find him so disruptive in the classroom mm. do you think if i actually did a, put him next to me it, i do bring him next to me as sometimes but maybe not as much as what you did it depends on the child jane and, and you have to find out the most important thing is to find out what he's interested in Okay. Because his interest will guide everything else. If you can really find out well, what he loves, makes him. He loves going on messages and brooming and doing all sorts of things, ex just active. So mm -hmm. I just let him keep on doing that. Because those yes, seem really to be the positive it. experiences. Wait, well, I, I had a what, girl. Yeah. Sorry. I had a girl in my class who needed that. She needed tons of movement and she was really uncoordinated, always bumping into everything, food all over her face, you know, like really uncoordinated. And she was going to be going to the elementary class in the following year. She'd been with me three years and these things hadn't resolved. She had some challenges at birth and she was going to the elementary class. And so we brought these encyclopedias, these big encyclopedia books. We brought some down to my class and then I just had her, oh, could you bring those up to elementary? Susan in elementary needs those books. And so, she, oh, yeah. And she'd get to carry these two, two heavy books up the stairs, open the door, to the door, up the stairs, and then bring them. And then later in the day, I would say, would you mind getting those books back from Susan for me? So, yes. so I had like this extra thing. So, you, you know, maybe there's things outside that this uh, child can water, but he needs to carry a bucket of water across yeah. But, you know, the playground or whatever space you have outdoors to do it. Create meaningful, heavy tasks. I, I know. And I find if I, if I go on about the work thing, I actually irritate the whole thing more. If, I, if it's anything to do with work, it's sort of like maths or anything like that. I just, th that, it's just that aggravates him. But, but what, what I do struggle with, and I don't know how to handle this is he also, he gets into fights with everyone and interferes with them. He, and mm -hmm. it's almost like he can't help himself. His yes. nose is really in everyone's business all the time. Yes. yes. So I was also wondering how do I address that? Do, yes. Yeah. I, I do. And I'm actually, I've become quite nasty. Like you said, I tell him that his nose is going to grow very long because it's in everyone's oh. business. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm oh. terrible. Oh. <laughs> I think it's telling you right there that his executive functions are just developing. How old is he? He is seven turning eight. Okay. He's still developing his executive functions. They're not there yet. It doesn't just end at six and different children are on different trajectories. So okay. for him, it's, so clear. It's, it's almost like it's a bit late. Yes. Not, I'm not saying it's late. But his are really things. delayed. One is the heavy work. The other thing is actually vocabulary work, spoken language work. Spoken language work is tied okay. to executive function. And it's also tied evolutionarily with reactive aggression. As we as a species improved our capacity to, to communicate with language, our reactive aggression decreased. And it's still decreasing as our language abilities increase. And they see this in young children that as their language abilities improve, their self-regulation abilities improve. So also work on language and, of course, grace and courtesy lessons. And, and, and what I did want to mention is I did call mom in. <clears throat> and 
but his mother actually has a lot of problems and she 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 almost is under the 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 feeling that she can't make a difference to to her child as a mother she's an inadequate mother so she like alienates herself from him and do you think that's why by not practicing the vocabulary and, and speaking at home that that that's why it's affected him as well or well, delayed now you, everything in our environment affects us even as so, adults but can i also make a children, difference but even what in the did classroom? you learn what did you learn today that you could share with that mom well well yeah well things well just now what you said the vocabulary being patient and um, about the negative him, thinking well i have i have told mom about that but I, I, I so, but, speak and then you also know that it takes time for us to master anything. So repetition is important. Just keep supporting. Always be compassionate. Always be on her side. Focus I, uh, on yes. what you can control in the classroom. Focus on what you can control in the classroom. And just love the mother. All children love their parents. Uh, yes. Even and that's what I did. I, I, I said that to her. I did. I said that to her. I said, you know what? He needs you. And I said, you've got to believe that you are the best mother to him. So I did speak like that to her and try to build her up and all of that. Because yeah. I need her on my side to be able to work with him. Because otherwise, so it's what, just, yeah. So I would suggest you focus on the assets of the child and the, and the mother. Okay. Skills. So just keep asset. focusing on the assets. Yes. Try not to focus on the deficits. Shemima. Okay. Thanks, Shemima. Shemima. Shemima, I'm so sorry. No, it's no problem. I've been all day. Yeah, so I've got um, a question, and I think it, it comes off Jane's um, scenario as well. We, um, is there a time when you can, where it's too late to develop executive function skills? It's never. Never, okay. ever, ever too late, even when you're 90. Okay. So as an adult, if we can improve the, those executive function skills as well. Absolutely. And then, sorry, this is now a follow-up question on that. So, like, I, I realize the more you sp speak about it, I, I think of myself as well versed in executive function. So I, I understand it, or I think I understand it really well. But um, I realized when you were speaking that I have a very good understanding of the mental flexibility and the working memory, but I struggle a little bit with the inhibitory control part. So I understand the self-regulation, but um, how my question was, how does Montessori um, nurture that inhibitory control? Because the other two, I can see it very clearly in the classroom. Mm. I love this question. Thank you, Shamila. Thank you for asking it. So this is why we have scarcity in the classroom. There's only one. You have to wait. All day long, you have to wait. And this is why we can do things like if you have metal insets and you, they're flying through the paper and you're, you know, you just put five pieces of paper out in the morning. You know, and they that they're going to be planning that night because they, they can't. It's all gone. They go to use it every day and there's no paper left. They're going to be planning. And first, boom, they're going to fly to those metal insets first thing in the morning, thinking ahead because of scarcity. So one of each material, except for movable outfits. And I think stamp game, you need a few. But other than that, one of each. And that that builds it right in, you know, and learning to observe the grace and courtesy we do with learning to observe somebody without touching their work. I mean, we're giving that racing courtesy lesson a lot, right? And that's inhibitory control, putting your attention where your feet are. So you're walking around rugs instead of across or on top of rugs. That's all inhibitory control. Okay. It's, I think it's everywhere. You can find a lot of examples. Yes, I think it's Putting makes, things down without yeah. making a sound, you know, putting it down, that's yes, inhibitory yes. control. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, sorry, I had one more question. Um, which I wrote down, but now I can't find it on my page. <laughs> I'll keep on <laughs> Come back to it. I'll ask. Anybody else want to ask while she's looking, or, or talk, or just comment? Noel, are you there? I guess not. Oh yeah, I am here. Thank you. Ah, did you have a question? Um, I also have a Kevin in my class, um, but he's adorable. And um, I do find that, um, you know, loving him more does work. 
So um, the behavior is changing. We do see the change. And um, just by listening to you saying that it takes time, um, I think I will do that. And yeah. um, looking forward to the outcome. Yeah, it's, we have to have so much patience. We get them for three years for a reason. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I want to I want to go in quick with my Thank with you. my little guy. I found I, I, I found an improvement last year, and then okay, I know his father works out the country for like about six weeks at a time, so it does that affects him as well. But um, and I do love my little Kevin guy too. I must say, so even <laughs> though he does drive me crazy, I I, I do I do love him. But of um, course. I, I found that at times he improves and then there's a regression. So would, would that keep happening until there's an, a total improvement type thing? And yeah, can it take just, years? Could he yeah. even leave me, my environment go up and still have these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Dynamic some, skill development uh, is real. It takes time and, and everybody's on a different schedule. We're not and all if, developing and, at the same and, time. And does trauma affect it? Like a trauma? Absolutely. So so if there's like a continuous, if the relationships aren't good at home and a child's exposed to like a continuous trauma, does it set them back for life? No. No. So I, I've recently started revealing um, that I am a survivor of sexual and physical abuse when I was a child for many years growing up. And I went to Harvard. It took me longer to get there. I didn't go right away. My, my path was a little circuitous, but I graduated from Harvard. Okay. okay. My master, my thesis won the Dean's Prize. So it's trauma is bad. <laughs> we don't want it. We don't, we, thank you guys for the hearts. We don't wish it on anybody. We certainly don't want to introduce it. But if it happens, we cannot pretend that these children aren't still developing and that okay. they don't still have hope. They can absolutely overcome. Resilience okay. is real. And having Jane in your environment, you are creating the supportive environment that helps them. These strong relationships, that supportive environment is a buffer against all that other stress. We can't control what's happening outside of our environment. But in our environment, we give them all the causes and conditions for optimal development. That's what we can do. Okay. And, and I wonder how much of a difference it does make. To have for the huge. child to have that does is it huge, huge? okay it's huge because it's huge. i i think a lot of children in our country are even living under quite stressful conditions whether it's the home yes. life safety uh, there's a lot going on here for little children yeah yeah it and may I think take sometimes them longer we forget but it. they can we still forget get it there. yeah okay now that's so good that's so positive to hear thank yeah. you yeah you can be encouraged yeah Okay. Anything else? So again, I Do just you remember to... Shamina? No, I, I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I thought I'd written down all my questions, but I had two um, half written sentences. So I think it was one of those. But um, I think that what Jane um, express is expressing is something that I find a lot with um, students, especially um, students or teachers that I work with, where um, it's like this, we committed to our Kevins, we, we believe somehow that um, we have to really do some self-talk to remind ourselves that there's faith, like we have to have faith that there's hope for this child. But then often um, we, may, we get caught into this thing of um, seeing the, the home environment as the excuse. You know, so like the home environment so bad, how much is my impact really going to help? Mm -hmm. And um, I find that like in my work, I have a colleague that um, I often go to and I say, oh, my gosh, I'm having a moment with the student. You know, she's really getting to me. Please, can you um, just like help me see the positive, or, you know, things like that. So I often have I, I think that that works really well. But I, I'm, I've become in my work a, a lot more aware of that feeling of how much my emotion can impact on my um, engagement with a child. So I think it's really nice to, to find a colleague that you can have that kind of backup with, you know, someone that you can speak to and say like, oh, I'm having a bad moment. My Kevin is really acting up today. 
um, please, I need help or, you know, shift my focus, show me something positive you saw today or remind me, even if it's the same positive thing you see every single day, it, start, it helps you to get started. Yeah. yeah. That's to me, that's so insightful. You just like, oh my gosh, that's like 20 years of social cognitive research. You just summed up in like two minutes. That's great. I watch a lot of your videos, Julia. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's all po focus on the positive as much as you can. I mean, don't pretend that you don't have work to do on what's unskillful. We still have to address that, but keep your attention on what's working yeah. to overcome our negativity bias. And always Absolutely. approach the families, especially with compassion. We have to love the families as much as we love the children, which is sometimes very hard for many of us because we, you know, because we know. Yeah, my colleague. So love just the families. My colleague just sent me a message to say that I know I'm that colleague you're speaking about and you drive me crazy. <laughs> so, it's driven crazy than the poor child or student, I think. <laughs> so, okay. And I see um, there's another question here um, from Tinova um, about having direct uh, disruptions. Um, oh, it's your child. Oh. Don't worry, it's not your child. <laughs> Wait, does anybody have my child? Let me tell you about my child. My son adopted from Kazakhstan, lived his first year of life in the orphanage. Tricky, tricky first year of life. So a lot to overcome. So when you talk to me about trauma, I, yeah, I've lived it with myself and also with my son. And he's doing wonderfully now. He's 17. It makes me crazy because he's 17, but he's doing wonderfully, right? It's nothing to worry about. And he, every day I went, to pick him up at school. And he was at Montessori school for primary. And his teacher would tell me what he did wrong. Every single day, it's like, up. Oh, he pushed so-and-so, he threw sand in the sandbox. He, you know, he bit someone. I was like, every single day. It was, I, I didn't want to pick him up. I would go to school and I'd be like, what did he do today? It's just constant, just constant. And this is, you know, th I'm supposed to know what I'm doing right? And this is my child, right? And I'm like, I'm supposed to know better, right? I, why, how could this happen? Biology is huge. Environment is huge. And children develop at their own pace. What we can do is be strong, be consistent, create an environment, a, a physical environment and an emotional environment with routines and consistent responses that supports their development, right? That's what we can do. And we just do that consistently day after day after day, year after year after year. And then all of a sudden, someday in the future, it's like, oh my gosh, it worked. You know, you can see little signs that it worked and that they're not always going to be the disaster, you know, that, that yeah, you're getting called for. Does that answer your question? Okay. I have to sign off. I'm so grateful to have had this time with you. And um, I'll put my email in the chat in case um, anybody wants to follow up with me on anything. You can. And uh, feel free, like I said, to visit my blog, matrilearning.com, or I have an Ask Matri blog there too. You can ask questions. I'll answer them for everybody. Ask them anonymously. Okay. This is fun. Thank you, Shamima, for having me. Thank you so much, Julia. It was so interesting. I really much. I think you just said very nice things about me, but the internet froze. So I thank you for thinking. I'm oh, just assuming. So <laughs>